Uh, but before we before we begin, uh, shall we begin with a word of prayer? So would you uh, bow your heads with me as we give uh, today's time to God? Holy Father, we praise you and thank you that uh, you give us this morning, you give us this day, and that each day, um, by your sovereign will, all things are kept um, good, um, pleasing, and uh, in your wise plans, in your uh, power and might, but also in your loving and gracious and merciful hand. God, we thank you that you are a God that has revealed yourself to us um, as such an amazing God, a God that is beyond comprehension, beyond human comprehension, and, and, and a God who is uh, totally holy and like no other. God, we just pray um, as we consider your words this morning, um, and in particular, uh, the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse 15 to 22. God, we pray that you would uh, give uh, me your Holy Spirit, that I may be able to uh, speak your word and your word alone. Help me to preach uh, nothing but the gospel. And God, I just pray that uh, today that we would be able to, as your people, as your church, as brothers and sisters in Christ, bought uh, by the precious blood of your son, that uh, we would be able to uh, come together and to be uh, uh, come together before your word, to hear your truth, to hear what you have done the wonders you have done for us and as we hear more and more of your great love shown through jesus uh that we would uh behold and trust in your good promises we pray this in your son's name amen uh okay so uh as i said uh today's message is entitled no other promise and we are looking at galatians 3 verse 15 to 22. uh before we begin maybe just a little bit of context and recap of our series uh just to uh get you guys introduced and uh on the same page okay so we have uh entitled our series on the book of galatians as called no other gospel if you remember, uh, the letter to the Galatians was written by Paul for a specific purpose. It was written in response to the controversy and debate that was between Jewish and Gentile Christians. In the book of Acts, chapter, chapter 15, what we, uh, it was around 13, ch chapters 13 to 15, uh, what we hear is more information about this debate. And as you can see on the screen, uh, the debate was around the problem of circumcision. And specifically, there were certain Jewish Christians who believed that unless you were circumcised according to the law of Moses, you would not be saved. This context is really important for us because uh, the passage that we are uh, considering today is still considering this problem that the Jewish Christians, the Judaizers, were uh, posing towards the Galatians. Specifically, there is a question of what we as human beings contribute to salvation. Do we do any part, do we have any part in making and determining whether we are saved. What we've seen in chapter three in Galatians three is that Paul has been arguing that salvation and the Holy Spirit comes by faith and not by works. That is only by believing in Jesus, not by any works of our own that we are saved and that we receive the Holy Spirit within us. Paul, in the previous passages up until now, has been giving various examples to do so. Two weeks ago, we uh, heard a, a message from Uncle Chris uh, on Galatians 3, I believe it was 1 to 9. And, and within this passage, uh, Paul argues from experience, and in particular, the experiences that the Galatians had when they received the Holy Spirit to show that it is by faith and not by works. Uncle Chris gave this mess, uh, this uh, picture in, in his uh, talk of uh, a marathon, right, of running the race and, and what, what started the race to begin with. And 
uh, what we see here in Galatians 3, 2 to 5, uh, he calls the, 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 uh, the Judaizers foolish and stupid because they began by the Holy Spirit. And why would they therefore finish by their own works, by their own flesh? That is that this Holy Spirit that they experience already and have within them is by faith and not by works. Last week, we heard a message from Uncle Ian uh, about how Christ became a curse for us that we might receive the blessing. And what Paul does here is argue from scripture, not from experience, from the Bible itself, and particularly the person of Abraham to show that, uh, that Abraham was righteous because he was a man of faith that it wasn't because of abraham's works but because abraham believed in the promises of god and so to believe in the promises of god the righteous shall live by faith and as we can see here in galatians 3 that those who rely on the works of the law are not by faith but are still under the curse today uh in today's passage Paul is going to use a different example. And he explains it very clearly in the start of this passage that he's going to give a human example. Specifically, the example that he's going to give is an example of a promise. He's going to, what, what Paul is ultimately going to do in today's passage is to show that all of the Bible and the message, the core message of the Bible has never been about a command, has never been about a law, but has been about a promise. That the gospel, the good news message that is given to you, how you can be right with God, how you can be saved and be uh, even called a child of God is not a message that says you have to fulfill these commands, you have to do these laws in order to, do, uh, to, to get to being a child of God, but rather by trusting that God has promised this to you. God has promised that you will be saved. God has promised that he will love you and he will keep you until the day that you see him face to face. And this is what I want us to consider and to reflect on this morning. Do you know that your salvation rests on this promise? Do you think and trust and depend on this promise day to day? So to get us to start uh, thinking about this, uh, I want to give you uh, uh, just like a small sort of uh, example, okay? Consider the difference between, let's say, a promise and a contract, okay? The type of promise that Paul is going to be talking about is actually going to be an inheritance. And so it's going to be a one-sided promise. The type of promise that we are considering here is like a promise where you uh, talk to someone, you say you want to uh, meet up with them, and they say, okay, I promised you that I will be uh, at this place at a certain time, at 10 a.m., let's say. What we see is, is that if somebody promises you that they will be somewhere at a certain time, this type of promise is one-sided. You, if you hear this promise, do nothing to fulfill the promise. It is the promise giver who is doing all of the work. Now, certainly you, if you hear such a promise and you say, oh man, I'm going to see my friend at 10 a.m. tomorrow at a certain place, you might still respond and plan accordingly. Yeah, you might organize what transport you would use, you might organize what time you will wake up. But the point here is to say that nothing you organize or do will make that promise fulfilled. Nothing you do will make that person be at that place at that particular time. The only person who can fulfill a promise is the one who is giving it. There is nothing that the promise receiver can do. This is very different from a contract, yes? So let's say uh, somebody says, I will give you $5 if you draw something for me, okay? In this way, the difference between a promise and a contract is that a contract is a two-way 
transaction. That for, uh, for the contract to really be fulfilled, both people need to hold their side of the bargain. And this is the main point that I want you to think about today. It makes no sense to treat a promise like a contract. And it makes no sense to treat a contract like a promise. It makes no sense for us to treat a contract like a promise because let's say you have this contract, somebody gives you $5, if you draw them something and you say, why didn't you give me $5? You know, you promised to. And they said, well, because you didn't draw something. The reason there is that both sides need to do something. Just because there is a, a, a potential that you will get $5 doesn't mean that you yourself do not need to fulfill or contribute to how that contract might be fulfilled. On the opposite side, right? If you say, well, what can I do? What can I do to uh, make you be there at a certain place at 10 a.m.? What can I do to make sure that you fulfill your promise? Uh, that seems kind of odd and strange. It is odd and strange because a promise is something that you don't obey. A promise is not something that you fulfill. A promise is something that you trust that someone else will do. In fact, the more you say, arguably, if you were with a friend and a friend promised you that they would be there at a certain place at a certain time, and you kept on saying, what can I do? Really, what it shows is that you don't trust the promise giver's ability to fulfill the promise. The more you try to do things as a promise receiver, the less you trust and the less you believe in the promise. So the main aim of today's message, the main point of today's passage is, is that the gospel, the way by which we as sinners are to be saved, is not a contract. It is a promise. The only way, the correct response to what God has said in his word is not obedience to the law, but faith-filled trust. And so in today's passage, I hope that we'll be able to consider more in depth the connection between the law that is given to Moses and the promise, which ultimately is the promise that was given to Abraham. So the structure of today's message, if you're taking notes, is, is that in verses 15 to 18, what we see is, is that uh, Paul is going to show that the law is not the promise. How are they connected? They're connected in such a way that the law doesn't cancel and doesn't contradict the promise that is given to Abraham. Verses 19 to 22 show a positive connection between the law and the promise, namely that what does the law do? The law illuminates, makes visible and bright and beautiful God's promise. And in doing so shows that God's promise is necessary. It is indispensable. The law reveals the promise. Let's begin. So Paul begins, as we've seen, with uh, the example that he's going to bring out in this passage. And the example that he's going to bring about is this example of a promise. Specifically here, uh, let's read it out. To give a human example, brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. The type of uh, a, uh, by, the, by the Greek, the type of covenant or promise that Paul is referring to seems to be a type of like will or testament, right? It is the type of uh, promise where, uh, which is a, a legal arrangement and it tells us how, like where property goes to, where sheep go to, where servants go to upon one's death. And the point that is being made here that Paul's trying to say is, when you have a promise like this, once a, a will has been set and then the person dies, there is nothing you can do to change that will. There is nothing you can do to uh, change uh, what happens and, and where those estate and those property or, or, or possessions go to 
once such an legal arrangement has been set. Because this legal arrangement is not a contract, it is a declaration. It is a declaration that says, this, as the person who, is, who has this property, once I die, I am declaring that it is this person. There is no one else that can make that type of declaration other than me. If we're considering this type of promise, then we must uh, wonder what type of promise is Paul thinking about here? Why does the gospel have anything to do with a promise? And the promise that uh, Paul is going to talk about is the promise that God gives to Abraham in the book of Genesis. As it says here, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Uh, for the, just as a sort of like a, a context, um, what we see in uh, Genesis in, in various places is, is that God's promise to Abraham is a, a promise to give Abraham a promised land, the land of Canaan, to give Abraham as many children as the stars in the sky. And as this passage says on the screen, uh, that Abraham will be known as the father of a multitude of nations. And finally, that there would be a blessing to Abraham, a blessing that's such that all nations will be blessed through Abraham. This is the promise that Paul is referring to. And so the question becomes this, right? Why does Paul use this promise to show that the gospel is a, is, a, is a promise, not a contract. What does God's promise to Abraham have anything to do with Jesus and how we become Christian? Isn't God's promise to Abraham simply about land and children? What does it have to do with salvation? And if Paul is just using a random uh, passage in the Old Testament, isn't he just using that to justify uh, his uh, uh, disobedience towards the law? That is, what is the significance and the importance of this promise? Um, what Paul is going to say is, is, is he's going to get deeper into the text. Yeah? And, and what we see here is, is that Paul uh, is so... Uh, detailed in his reading and his analysis of the Old Testament because he believes that every single word of it is God's word. And what he says is, is that what Paul argues here is, is that notice that in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, when it gives uh, this promise to Abraham, it never says offsprings, but offspring. Paul notices that here, this promise has got more to do with the amount of people that Abraham shall have as children, but a particular child, a particular descendant of Abraham, which Paul refers to as obviously referring to Jesus. And so what we see uh, in, in, in every sort of uh, mention of the promise, it is true that the Lord appears to Abraham and says to your offspring, not offsprings. Why is this important? It's important because what we need to know, notice is, is that God's promise to Abraham is not only a promise to Abraham, but to all of the nations and to the world. What God is doing here is not just showing his favor his goodwill to a particular person that he likes, right? Rather, what God is saying is, is that he's going to use Abraham and particularly Abraham's offspring to do something. This reminds us of the first promise that is given in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 3, after the fall, when uh, human beings, Adam and Eve, disobey God, God promises, nevertheless, that there would be an offspring of Eve that will finally defeat Satan, finally defeat evil, and ultimately help us to return back into God's presence, into a new Eden. 
And so what Paul is saying here is, is that ultimately this promise to Abraham is really significant, not just because it is a physical inheritance, an inheritance of just Jewish people living in the land of Canaan, but a spiritual inheritance. God's promise here is a promise not only to the Jewish people that they will inherit a certain uh, uh, plot of land, but it is an inheritance and a promise towards all of us who believe in Jesus Christ, all of us who will inherit God's land and inherit a place as God's children. This is why in the previous passage, in Galatians 3, uh, verse 8, what we see is, is that this, uh, Paul says that the scriptures preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. That this promise to Abraham was already the gospel. And that Abraham already knew that this message was much more than a message of getting land, but a message of being God's uh, people forever and ever. If it was just to be just a physical inheritance of having children living in Canaan, this wouldn't lead to uh, all of the nations being blessed through Abraham. The land and the offspring that was promised must ultimately be spiritual. And so because this promise uh, of being God's child of salvation is, uh, is, uh, is a, a, a promise, it therefore shows that what Paul's going to say is, is that therefore salvation does not come from the law. Salvation does not come from our works. Verses 17 to 18 says this. This is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterwards does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham as a promise. Paul's logic is, uh, in, in these verses, goes something like this. That before the law of Moses, Abraham was already a person of God. Abraham was already a Christian. And so because Abraham believed and was a saint, a person of God, before the law of Moses, it shows that the law of Moses is not how we become saved. Rather, the law of Moses, even if it was a contract, doesn't make a previous promise void, doesn't make a previous uh, promise not apply, because uh, the law of Moses can't reverse what God has declared his intentions to be in terms of our inheritance beforehand. And so if our inheritance did come by the law, then it wouldn't be by a promise because there's a difference between a contract and a promise. But God gave a promise to Abraham. Notice here the, the word uh, gave when, when, God, when it says God gave it to Abraham as a promise, is a, a word meaning free gift. And, and it comes from the word, uh, the Greek word charis, which uh, our word charity comes from, uh, that idea of grace, that God freely gave it to us in a promise, that it was uh, costly, but also free in, the term, in, in terms that we didn't pay for any of it. We didn't pay for any of this inheritance. We inherited it simply because of God's declaration to do so. And so my first application for this first section of our passage today is we must remember and know that salvation doesn't come by the law, but by a promise. The practical uh, conclusion of this first half is this, yeah. How do you interact with God? How do you deal with God? And the answer is, and, and, and what the Bible tells us is, is that God deals with us and interacts with us, not on the basis 
of our works, but on the basis of his promises. It is not because we did this and this and this and this that leads us towards uh, an inheritance, towards uh, God being pleased to us, but simply because God has said, I will. To put it a different way, in the law, the law of Moses, God says, you shall not do this. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. But in this gospel message, in, in, in this promise, God doesn't say, you shall not do this, but I will do this. I will send my son. I will send my son to die in your place. I will freely accept this uh, atonement and this sacrifice. And I will freely blot out and forgive your sins. And I will give you the right to be my child. Salvation in Jesus doesn't rest on a law that we break. It rests on a promise that God cannot break. And this is my question to you. Do you live in this way? Do you live by faith or are you still trying to work for your salvation? Do you know that everything that you are doing in this life should be dependent on this fact that God has already promised all things to you? God has already given you a higher status, a higher calling a higher grace than anything you could attain any job position that you could get by your plan uh, that by your own hands would never be as high and as great as to be called child of the living god beloved before the foundation of the earth there is nothing that you could possibly do that would let you have this and there's nothing that you could possibly gain that is more than this promise. Salvation doesn't come by law, but by promise. Okay, next section. The next section therefore considers uh, this question of the law. And, and, and the question here is, well, if all of this only requires that I, uh, that I trust in the promises of God, that I trust that God has saved me and that God will do all that he says he will do, then what is the purpose of the law to begin with? Why do I need the law? Why was the law given in the first place? And, and the objection here is, is that it seems kind of weird, right? In God's word, uh, most <laughs> of the Old Testament is, is, is uh, either a description or an explanation of the law of Moses, right? And here, what Paul's, uh, what, what the objection seems to be is, is that, well, if Paul focuses on Abraham, then Paul's use of Abraham therefore gets rid of Moses. Where is the role or the point of the law of Moses if everything is by promise? And Paul's answer is this, that it was added because of transgressions, that the law is needed in order to show us the need of a promise. Uh, Paul is going to actually explain this uh, in much greater detail in the book of Romans. So uh, I'm just going to give a, a, few, a few passages uh, from there uh, to show the role of the law. And in Romans 3.20, Paul says this, that through the law comes knowledge of sin. Romans 4 verse 15 says, where there is no law, there is no transgression. And finally, uh, Romans 7, 7 says, if I had not been for the law, I should not have known sin. Uh, I would encourage you to read the book of Romans if you want to like uh, know more about this. But the basic summary goes something like this. What is the point of the law then? Why was the law given? The law was given to expose sin. The law was given to show us uh, the presence and the inevitability of sin. The law is there to shine a light that shows that everywhere else is darkness. 
everywhere else is moral filth. Without the law, we would even think that we might be able to get to God by ourselves. But the law's job is to show us that it is way too far and way too difficult of a task. Just as how uh, a few weeks ago, uh, Brother Sam gave a uh, a message and and he gave this analogy of trying to uh, swim across the ocean in order to uh, get to uh, Hong Kong or Shanghai. I forget forget where. Um, and, And the point is this, right? If you didn't know how far away Shanghai or Hong Kong or, you know, uh, China is uh, from Australia, you might even think that you could probably swim there. But the law works as kind of like a navigation tool, a navigation tool that says, actually, it's thousands of thousands of kilometers away. It's actually so far that you can't possibly do it. It tells you it would take you a uh, uh, half a year's worth of swimming in order for you to actually swim there. And as soon as you know this, as soon as you realize this, as soon as you are made aware of this, you realize the impossibility of the task. You realize that you are not set for this job. You cannot do this job. And so this is what the law is doing for us and for uh, and uh, how it contributes to the promises of God. It shows us that unless we use and uh, depend and trust in the promises of God, there is no other way. There is no other method, no other gospel, no other promise that will get us there. This, uh, this, uh, role of the law, uh, Paul says, is a temporary role in in this passage. And he says that the law was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Uh, I'm just going to quickly go through this because it is a a very tricky uh, passage. Uh, The point here is is that uh, we'll see this in uh, the uh, passage after today's passage, uh, what we see is, is that Paul conceives of the law and explains to us that the law works like a guardian, right? Until a person is grown up and is old enough to actually have an inheritance, to actually have this inheritance, there needs to be somebody who holds on to this law. And so in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, uh, this law is like a guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. This idea of that it was there until the offspring was made and given through angels and intermediary. What Paul is referring to is he's referring to uh, spiritual beings that were there um, in the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. And also the word angel just means messengers. So all of the messengers All of the people, the prophets and and, uh, the people of God that continued to uh, uh, speak and uh, keep the word of God up until the point of Jesus. Uh, I've given you a few passages uh, on the screen in case you wanted to uh, look into more about this idea of how uh, angels were used to pass down uh, the law of God. Uh, But ultimately, this law of God is given through angels by an intermediary, and Paul is probably referring to Moses here. The picture goes something like this, that throughout the ages, there needed to be a way for people to remember and to hold and to keep on to this promise of a savior, this promise of an offspring who would come and ultimately through which all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. And what the law does is is that it works in a way that continues the message, that passes the baton further and further and further until the moment in which it was to be fulfilled. And so the law works in a way to expose us for the need of the promise. And to remind us and to, re- to for us to remember this promise, for us to hold on to this promise until the day 
which it is fulfilled. As such, how does the law and the promise connect according to Paul? Paul is going to say that uh, this intermediary that he's talking about implies that there is more than one, but God is one. That that is that there are, uh, Paul is referring to the fact that God gave the promise to Abraham and God gave the law to Moses. And yet here, Paul reminds us that God is one, that we're still talking about only one God, right? And so that these two things must connect. And yet, in the next sentence, Paul says that it can't be the case that they contradict. It can't be the case that the law of God is contrary to the promises of God. Rather, what Paul is ultimately going to conclude is, is that the law doesn't contradict the promise. It only enhances it. The law doesn't, doesn't, doesn't contradict and get rid of the need for the promise, but only more greatly shows us the need, uh, the need for this promise, the need for salvation, the need for God to act according to his declaration not according to our uh, righteousness and our works. You can think of it like this, right? Uh, the law and the promise is not like two different uh, musical notes that clash towards each other, but are like two different notes that act like melody and harmony, that work together, that only bring forth more from each other, that only make things more brighter, more beautiful, more complex, more clearer, more vivid, that the law is there because we need the law in order to see how the gospel is necessary. And this is my final application to you. And I'm going to end the sermon here. If you are like me, uh, there are so many times in our lives that even though we know this core message, we still live. I still live by my own works that in the, in a, in the everyday uh like sort of hustle and bustle of uh, daily life there are so many stresses so many fears and insecurities so many times for uh, my pride to come out uh, my ambitions my ego myself to come out such that i want to not trust in god and his promise of his works but i want to trust in my own strength and the way that i will do it if that speaks to you, I hope that speaks to you. Uh, Paul's answer to that is this, right? How then are you going to trust more in God's promises? How are you going to see your need of this promise? How are you going to go back from a false gospel, a gospel that tells you that your strength is enough, that you can rely on yourself? How can you uh, bring yourself back to God's message and, 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 and come to him in faith and in humility. And the answer is, you don't, you trust the promise when you really see the law. The application is this. The reason why you probably don't trust God's promises, the reason why you still want to rely on your own works is because you don't know God's law enough. It's because you don't read God's word enough. It's because if you... You, you don't focus on just what the law is saying. Because if you read God's law, if you read God's word, if you really knew this God, this God who is the creator of all things, who is on his throne, surrounded by th thousands and thousands of heavenly angels, who is so holy that if you were to come before him, you would feel fear like you would not know that all of your inner desires would be exposed. If you truly knew this guy, you would probably trust in that promise more. You would probably rely on Jesus more. You would probably depend on this gospel more. The way that we see the necessity of the gospel is through the law. The way that we see our needs, the way that we see just how beautiful and how precious it is 
that Christ would die for us only comes when we see the failures that we have, our, our, our shortcomings and our failures when it comes to fulfilling the law, our sinful nature before God's eyes and God's ways. It's like a person who, uh, let's say, uh, imagine if, uh, you know, uh, coronavirus gets like completely worse and we have to like run away from Australia and, and we really need a plane ticket to get out of here. And uh, your uncle has promised you that you, uh, that he would get you a plane ticket. And you might say, well, I don't trust that. I don't know, maybe I should make my own plans. And you make all of these plans based on the idea that you don't need this promise. And yet, once you look at the different laws, once you know certain things, you know that uh, a plane ticket costs more than you can afford. You know that currently plane tickets are uh, being only sold to certain people, et cetera, et cetera. The more you know of your situation, the more you can evaluate whether you need a promise. The more you see uh, your own situation, the better you can see what promises are necessary and not necessary. It's the same with us, with our spiritual life. The more you, uh, what the Bible shows us is more and more of our spiritual state. The more we can see ourselves as we really are, not in terms of our deluded perceptions of ourselves, not in terms of our sort of uh, biased version and picture of ourselves, but as we really are before God, the more we see that there, there is no other way. There is nothing within us or outside of us that will make us good. So I have two application slash discussion questions for you. And my question to you is this. How can you trust more deeply in the promise of God? How can you take this promise that has, God has given to you, this declaration, this beautiful declaration that says, I have said, you can trust in me. I will fulfill this promise. I promise you that if you trust me, I am a faithful God. I am a God who is powerful and wise and mighty and loving and gracious. And I will keep you all the days of your life. Trust in me. Don't trust in your own understanding. Don't trust in this world. Don't trust in what other people say. How can you have this type of trust in the promises of God? And secondly, how might the law of God help you with this? How, how much do you know of God's ways? How much do you know of how high his ways are? How holy his ways are? How pleasing his ways are? How, how much joy and peace do you think you could really have in this life? How much patience and kindness do you think could overflow within you? What is the truest way? And the best way of living in this life, the way that leads to the most flourishing. If you come to his law and delight and meditate in it, I can assure you, you will see heights and wondrous things that you have never seen before. Psalm 119, I think verse 18 says, open your eyes, God, that I may behold wondrous things from uh, your law. And that is my prayer to you and my encouragement to you, that if you only looked, you would be pleased to show you more and more such that you trust in him more and more and such that you live in a way that is uh, greater and pleasing before him. So let's think about these things in discussion groups and uh, I'm just gonna close it in a quick prayer. Holy Father, we can only praise you and thank you. We can only give you all glory and worship and honor uh, and all uh, glory to your name. Uh -huh. That not It is not by what we have done, but what you have done. It is not because of who we are, but because of who you are. 
is not because of our attempts and failures to uh, fulfill your law, but because of uh, your promises and how unshaking they are, um, how uh, sturdy and, and, and strong and dependable and reliable that you truly are our rock and our fortress. You truly are uh, our foundation that we can build upon and know that and nothing would shake it. But we just praise you that you've given us um, such an amazing good news and gospel and this promise. And God, we just pray that you would give us more faith. Help us to trust in these promises more and more. Give us eyes that we may see more and more from your law, from your word. And help us to learn of your ways and, uh, yeah, flourish and, and be fruitful within them. And in all of this, may your name and your name alone be glorified. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.